Sorry. Hey, good morning. As we uh, get ready to get started in a few minutes, we got about four minutes to our uh, start point. Uh, make sure you got your uh, coffee ready. Uh, but most important, questions. Uh, there's a chat option here, so make sure if you do have specific questions you wondered about from either a, uh, a retired OSHA investigator or a person that's been involved in safety for 28 years, please let us know. Uh, we want to make sure this webinar is informative and uh, answers your questions specifically, okay? So thank you very much. We'll be going um, in about three to four minutes, we'll get started. I also have a technical assistant here that's going to do make sure everything works correctly. So if you hear uh, me ask Maxwell to do something, that's my uh, technical advisor in the background here. So, uh, um, hello, Maxwell, why don't you put up our first PowerPoint presentation slide so we can uh, have them look at uh, something besides Larry and I. But. Uh, Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to our workplace safety webinar series. And today the topic we're going to be talking about is OSHA out the door, what to expect, what to prepare for. And uh, as my uh, technical assistant advances and changes things around, I'd like to uh, ask Larry to uh, give us a brief introduction of his history with OSHA, his history with safety. And then I will go from there. Okay, great. Good morning, Tim. Good morning, everyone out there uh, joining our presentation. Uh, I spent over 16 years with Minnesota OSHA as a uh, safety investigator, primarily in general industry settings and focusing on 
uh, machine guarding, uh, mechanical power presses, uh, fabricating equipment, and associated with uh, other other areas, uh, lockout, tagout, and and things like that because they're so important. Uh, prior to my time with OSHA, I was uh, I was in a small company that provided safety solutions for manufacturers. And uh, um, since I retired from the state a few years ago, I've been associated with OECS uh, providing uh, hopefully help uh, to the many uh, employers that call on us. Great. My name is Tim Peterson. I'm the Vice President of Operations with OECS. Uh, I've been with uh, OECS for going on 28 years. So I've been involved in a lot of the uh, situations where Larry's been part on the side of OSHA and such. So when we put this together, our goal is to have it as an open discussion, but give you a feeling and a preparation need of how to get ready and what you can and couldn't do. And maybe some of the things that Larry um, kind of bothered you a little bit as an investigator or kind of threw up some flags and stuff. So Maxwell, if you want to go to our presentation, we'll get rolling. So. Again, a little history on myself and Larry, we've already covered it, but again, my email and phone numbers there if you need anything. So one of the things we're going to be doing and we've added to our presentations is anybody that's attending this webinar, uh, upon completion, you'll receive an evaluation. Complete that evaluation and send it back to the email that's, that'll be on there. You'll receive a certificate uh, for continuing education hours. We've uh, gone through the processes and had our seminars and our webinars approved. So you will get uh, one uh, continuing ed hour for this process. So please, if that's something you need for your certifications, please uh, make sure you get that accomplished and we'll do our part. So involvement, please enter questions, use the chat. Uh, Maxwell will uh, let us know what the questions are. We'll answer them specifically for you. Uh, get us involved as much as possible for your specific industries. It's very, very, very important to make sure you come out of this webinar with something that you need and go towards. OECS has been around for approximately 30 years. Our goal or our mission is to inspire a strong safety culture and having the knowledge of what to do with OSHA is one of those key elements of how to handle it and be prepared and not have that moment of fear and trauma. So as we get started with this, we're gonna start out with our first survey. If OSHA walked into your business today, whether you're a construction site or a general industry, it doesn't matter, how would you feel you'd be ready? Would it be, hey, I'd ace it? Well, I'd be okay, but we're not really ready as much as I'd like to be, or not good. Take a few seconds, respond to that. We'll get you the uh, results of that poll. But what it does for Larry and I, it gives us a little direction to see how depth and what direction we want to really go for that. So thank you for taking this uh, few minutes and a few moments, excuse me, with the poll. Right, looks like we're getting a lot of good responses. Well, it does, Tim. It looks like we're getting uh, most people appear to think that we'd be doing okay, but room for improvement. Excellent. Well, then our goal today is to get that level of uh, concern uh, up to where, hey, we're going to ace it, and it's not going to be a big issue on that part. So uh, as we get back into our presentation, we're going to work towards that goal. So thank you very much for uh, our, being part of that. And uh, we'll work on our part of it from that point forward. So, <clears throat> so Maxwell, do I get back to the presentation? Thank you. Hang on, folks. We got a moment of technical difficulty. We'll get there. So can we get the uh, shared results off the screen? So the uh, 
one thing that we want to talk about, and if you want to, Larry, if you want to put back Larry and I on the screen, I want to just let you know that we're not going to spend a lot of time on the pandemic, but it's, again, if you as a participant have any specific question, we'll do our best to answer them. It's a concern right. that um, everybody has, and there's still a lot of unknowns, but we're going to talk briefly about it and uh, work towards that on the portion of it. So what uh, constitutes, a question just came up, uh, a medical, that one came off the screen too quick, medical, I'm sorry. So on the, so. Okay, so what I see right now is the uh, poll results on the screen. So, but uh, if um, you could bring up that chat question again, that would be great, but we'll get back to him. I apologize for that. So uh, where do you look at it as an investigator when there's specific standards come out? Is that something that you focus on, on, a, on a, or is that just depending on what happens within that industry, Larry? As far as, um... What what are you what are you driving at there? Well, Jim? for instance, on this pandemic, we'll talk about it very briefly. Sure. But is that something you focus on, or is it just hey, if it shows up, we'll address it at that time? Well, I think uh, pandemic has been a focus for OSHA uh, since it came out, but that's really how it's how it's being addressed has been a moving target uh, based upon what's going on uh, in in the uh, uh, in the area at any given time. So great. So Matt, will you want to get back to our presentation? That would be wonderful. Thank you. So as we get through the print the presentation and we move on, um, I want to make sure we understand where we're going and how that presentation really want to works for you on that part of it. So uh, what are we preparing for and what's the OSHA expectations is really what our concern on. So when OSHA walks in the door, what are they anticipating and what are they looking for? So I want to go to the next slide and really, how would you summarize it says here to assure that all workers in the United States are provided with a safe and healthy work environment? Well, well that, Larry, how does that work for you? That is the, uh, that is the goal of OSHA to make sure that uh, workers have a uh, safe and healthful uh, place of employment. Uh, they go home at night uh, in the same condition that they started the day in. Uh, and it's, it's probably good to remember that even though there is uh, a multitude of OSHA regulations, those regulations are the ground floor, the minimum requirements for uh, employers to follow. Excellent. Thanks. So going back to our presentation and the flow of, of that, when we look at that OSHA investigation and we start that investigation out, the things I want really you to, you to kind of interject on is where do we start? What's this comment that you see on the screen now? It says enter without delay. Can you kind of go through those four bullets? Sure, Larry? sure, Tim. The, um, the, the laws pertaining to OSHA allow an investigator to enter an establishment and not be delayed by an employer uh, for a uh, excessive amount of time. Um, investigating within a reasonable limit and manner, uh, the investigator gets to look at whatever they want to, whatever they believe is important to the safety of the employees. And so that includes every piece of the uh, facility, all the equipment and the facility itself. And also uh, the investigator OSHA has the right to talk to any employees privately and uh, the employer as well to ask questions to get a better perspective on what's happening. Fabulous. So a question came up to me a few weeks ago that said, if I don't have the right people in my office, I can tell OSHA that they can't enter. Well, every employer does have the right to deny entry to OSHA. And um, OSHA has the right to do an inspection. So you get kind of a catch-22 situation. Um, it's best to try and accommodate the investigator and work through it. The investigator does want to get the appropriate information 
um, and can, can construct the inspection in such a way that that can hopefully be accomplished. Um, if they deny, if the employer denies entry, that can result in a, um, a court order and a warrant and a sheriff being involved uh, in the inspection and it just becomes a lot more involved. So okay. it's best to avoid that. Thank you. So Maxwell, we'll get back to our presentation as we go through the flow of what other things we wanna look at when we get into this, this OSHA investigation. So, and we're looking for a slide to advance. Yeah, yeah. press the button. Yeah. Sorry about that, folks. So what's allowed and what's not allowed? So now, what, before we jump into yeah, that, sure. turn over so they can see your face and stuff. We're looking at workplace hazards. Can I or should I take pictures? And how should I get involved as far as being able to ask you, somebody that I might fear, because you're pretty intimidating as a oh, yeah, absolutely. And what should I and shouldn't I be doing on that part of it? So Larry, what's your thoughts on that? The employer is required, uh, some management person is required to accompany the investigator on the inspection. And it is always advisable to take notes. And um, if, uh, if the employer wants to take pictures of what the investigator is taking pictures of, that's a good idea. Ask all the questions that you want, but don't hinder the inspection. Don't try and hold up the inspection uh, because the, the uh, inspector is just trying to do his job. Okay, so it says take pictures. If you take a picture as an investigator, you're, you're recommending I should take the same one. So you're saying that you do or do not share your photos that you take as an investigator. OSHA will not share photographs or notes uh, during the inspection. And uh, so that's why it's best to take pictures of what the investigator is taking pictures of. And just because a, a, an inspector is taking pictures does not mean that that's going to result in a citation. It just might be something that's a curiosity at that time. So I can ask you, so what are you actually looking at or, or what's this picture? Or I can ask you questions like that. Sure, it's always uh, good to say, is there a concern here so that, uh, so that you get a better understanding Fabulous. of what's, what's on the in inspector's mind right now? Okay, Maxwell, as we move through our presentation, we're looking at what the investigator is allowed to do to make sure that everybody understands that. But we're also looking at what are you specifically going to look at? And as you see the slide up here, and we're talking about it, it says workplace hazards that have the potential. That's kind of a curious word. What do you mean by potential when as an investigator? Well, if somebody can get into a hazardous area on a piece of equipment and they could get hurt by it, there's a potential to be injured. Uh, if somebody is working at heights and they're not appropriately protected by a guardrail or something like that, there's potential for, for something bad to happen. Perfect, okay. So that's what you're really looking at as a broad picture. Basically, anywhere that employees are exposed to a hazard uh, is what the investigator is going to focus on. Okay. So when we look at it and it says OSHA investigator looks for it, and we have a list of stuff here on the screen where we start out with the general duty to serious, to exposure, to proximity and stuff. How does this general duty thing fit into it? If okay. those of us are not real aware of what general duty is all about. Sure. So... OSHA has regulations that cover nearly everything. And the, the books of regulations are basically dictionary sized books. Uh, sometimes there will be a recognized hazard that no standard has been written for. And so the general duty clause is available <clears throat> for OSHA's use at that point. And that basically says, <clears throat> that every employer is required to provide a place of employment that's free of recognized hazards that could cause injury or death to employees. So that's what the general duty is about. And 
looking at a particular hazard, uh, the investigator will look at our employees exposed and if they are, how much time are they exposed for and how close to the hazard are they exposed? Uh, are there extenuating work conditions that could increase the likelihood of an injury occurring? And, and does the employer know about this uh, particular hazard? Okay, duration, um, distance and stuff, is that a factor that you get into then? Oh, and you is. mentioned, I mean, and how, how crucial is that? Well, uh, the amount of time of, uh, an employee is exposed to the hazard is going to uh, factor into the penalty that is um, uh, levied if a, if a penalty is levied. Okay, thank you. So we look at that factor, seriousness, duration, mm -hmm. time, all that factors. Now, when you're on site, who controls that on-site uh, visit? Well, the, the investigator has the capability to go anywhere that he wants, but typically they're going to ask the employer, what's the layout of the land? Uh, you know, is there a particular path that you take visitors on, but I do want to see the whole place. Okay. So kind of a give and take in that fashion. So we kind of laid out the overall part, but when you first arrive, it talks about showing credentials and such. Is, is that a requirement? Do you have to show proof of who you are? Yes, absolutely. The, uh, uh, the investigator will show credentials to, to management and uh, let the management person know what the reason for the inspection is and um, gonna try and find out, uh, you know, what, what's the level of training and who's got responsibility uh, for, for what's going on. In so on a preparation side, it's really important for an industry to say, hey, we got a team or we got a person that's gonna respond and come up and talk to you, the OSHA investigator. Sure, many times it's going to be a, a production manager, it could be a human resources person, it could be a, a dedicated safety individual, depending upon you know, what the size of the company. And um, hopefully there's more than one person because that designated person could be away at the time OSHA comes, comes to the door. And it's good to have a number two so people can have a fallback. Fabulous, so as we move on and You've done that uh, introduction. You're at the front desk and they said, hey, we're glad you're here. Welcome aboard. Yeah. Um, what I want you to do is we want to go through this presentation on what the next step is. So Maxwell, if we can move to that next slide, that would be great. And then we can talk about where do we go and what the process is from there. So it talks about opening conference. Right, so there's three pieces to an inspection, an opening conference, a walk around, and a closing conference. And in the opening, uh, the investigator is gonna say, this is why I'm here, and I wanna look at your injury and illness logs and any other inspection records that you might have, and specifically looking at your safety programs and your training question, training uh, records, and answer any questions that uh, the employer might have. Who could be part of this opening conference? Anybody, um, OSHA, OSHA says any, anybody can participate. And in the case of uh, if the facility is uh, represented by a union, uh, it's important to notify the union steward or senior un union person on site uh, that OSHA is here and they have the right to participate in the inspection. Okay, so the number of people isn't an issue to you, the investigator. No, not at all. Great. Okay, if you look at the programs and the training records, can these be brought to you uh, electronically? Yes. Uh, you know, every, everything is going on network and electronically these days. Uh, so whatever the, whatever the employer is using as a means to communicate with the employees, uh, that's fine. If uh, safety programs are online in, in the company's network, then that's one way to look at them. Uh, training records, they have to be able to be presented to an investigator some form that shows that these employees were trained on this particular topic on this particular date and who did the training. So 
do you at that time explain to them specifically why you showed up? Oh, sure. There's, uh, there's a few reasons why OSHA is going to show up. Most of the time, it's because of what's called a programmed inspection. Uh, based on the company's industrial code, companies are selected for inspection on a somewhat random basis. And uh, that's going to be a comprehensive, complete inspection. Uh, and and um, that's probably the bulk of all inspections. Okay. Another reason is employee complaints, that if an employee is uh, filing a complaint with OSHA because of an alleged hazard, OSHA can come in. And then they'll look at only the hazards that have been described in, uh, in, in the complaint. Another reason for an inspection could be a serious injury or a fatality. Okay, thank you. So as we move through and now we've finished that opening conference and we go through what we're gonna be working at and handling next, we now walk out there and you're in the plant. Right. Okay, a couple of things before we get into some specifics. You are required to abide by all their policies and procedures, personal protective equipment and such, correct? That is correct, okay. yes. Who leads this walk around? Do you take charge of that or, or is that something that the industry does? Well, it's kind of both because typically the inspector is not gonna know the lay of the land uh, but does want to be able to see all areas of the facility. So it's kind of a hand-in-hand -hand, uh, situation. Great. Okay. So now, walk out, you have your PPE on, you have your team, whoever's going to be wandering with you. And as we go through our presentation, I want you to show and look at some of the things that we've seen and want to let you know how much is that an impact to you. So if we go back to our presentation, Maxwell, and we do that walk around and we talk about looking for workplace hazards, interviewing employees, kind of give us a just of how that really starts out. So, well, that's just it. The, the, the investigator is going to be looking for hazards in the workplace uh, that employees are exposed to or could be in, exposed to. And um, uh, the inspector will find an employee and talk to that person in private and basically uh, typically, we'll ask the employer to give them enough space to have a private conversation. So does every investigator, talks about in the industrial hygiene, does every investigator automatically cover noise and environmental and air quality and such? No, there's, there's two categories of OSHA investigators. One is the uh, safety investigator and the other is the health investigator. Uh, health investigators are typically industrial hygienists or chemical engineers, and they will uh, be more involved with doing sampling for hazardous stuff in the workplace. Okay, so that interview, uh, can that take place right there on the floor? Do they have to go to a private room or what when you're interviewing an employee? During a regular routine inspection, it is uh, most common to interview employees right where they're working, unless there is something else that would prevent uh, a conversation from taking place, such as it being really, really loud. But the idea is to uh, do an interview and a fairly brief, a few minutes or so, where the employee is working, so not to disrupt the uh, flow of work unnecessarily. Great. Okay, so now we're walking around and we're starting to see some things. So if we go into our presentation, Maxwell, some of the pictures that I pulled up over the years, I look at it and I want to make sure that, that you can identify and come back with, wow. So, well, first of all, we'll go back to this mask thing real, real briefly and stuff. And that is, if you see an industry that's following some good work practices, those are, those are positives in your eyes or how do you view that? Oh, of course. Uh, you know, at this point in time, there's no uh, governmental mandate to be yep. masked up, uh, but certainly it's good practice in, in many settings, and it's, it's dependent upon the actual environment that workers are working in. Excellent. So whether it's construction or general industry, these are the things that we look at, and whether, again, we look at it as a social distancing issue. These are things that you as the investigator kind of look as a general overall deal. And whether we're pro against or however our viewpoint is, kind of remember that it's just something that is part of our world today. 
and OSHA is going to evaluate and look at it in one way, shape, or form. Well, that's right. And at this point in time, uh, I believe OSHA would be asking about uh, COVID policies that the employer has okay. in place. Excellent. Great. So now let's get into the guts of this investigation. Now you're walking through that facility. So as we get back to our presentation, Maxwell, and we look at some of the things that you see, how does that draw your attention to either a hazard, quote, or a citation? So something as simple as barrels that are overflowing, some housekeeping issues. Is really housekeeping a factor when it comes to OSHA? Well, it sure can be. Uh... Taking a look at a facility, if the place is unkempt, if there's, uh, you know, oily rags on the ground and, and uh, it's not clean as it should be, that may give uh, the investigator kind of an idea as to, well, where are these folks at in, in the big scheme of things? Do they have safety programs that they're following? Okay. Now, this is not a prettiest picture, but again, one of your strong points or things you were when we were with OSHA was machine guarding and lockout, tight out and stuff. How do you look at when you're looking at exposures? And we'll switch to this slide here where we've got a, a guarding issue and exposure. And I, as a, the employer, say, hey, that saw is not being used anymore. You know, it's out of service. It's, we haven't used it. How do you as the investigator evaluate stuff like that? Well, the investigator is going to take a look at the situation overall. Has this been used in the past? Um, could it be used in the future? And as part of determining that, the inspector is going to be talking with employees to get a handle on that. If the saw that's uh, unguarded and out there available for employee use if it's been used, it's uh, potential for a citation. How far back can they look on that, that, on that if it has been used? Typically, OSHA can look back six months. Okay, thanks. So as we go to our next slide, and this is obviously a lot of machine guarding and guard, does something like this need to be totally guarded or what options do you have as guarding to, to accomplish the goal of keeping them from a hazard? Well, the idea is to prevent employees from having access to the hazard area. So while if we're looking at these, uh, this piece of equipment with open chains and sprockets, if an employee can get to it, it's an issue. If the employee cannot physically get to this piece of equipment because it's got machine guarding or it's sufficiently barricaded off so that you cannot get to it, well, then the uh, investigator is going to keep on moving. So you say sufficiently barricaded. So if I put up a, a yellow chain and a sign on it says, do not enter, um, how would you evaluate that as sufficient? I would probably say that that is not sufficient. Uh, guarding by decal is not a recognized means of guarding. Okay. Thank you. So as we move on through this walkthrough, and again, you can, just to remind people, you can have whoever you want on that walkthrough. Right. Chris. Who do you prefer to have on the walkthrough? I prefer to have somebody who knows the area, who can uh, provide uh, detail and information about what's taking place in this particular part of a facility. Okay. So again, as we're preparing for the people that are watching, make sure that we have that plan in place and the right people with the knowledge of the operation, of the process, can help and answer those questions that's immediately right. rather than waiting until the end and kind of go back and figure out what's happening, right? That's right. Excellent. So as we go through the walkthrough again, we're walking through a facility and Matt, if you can put our presentation back up, that'd be great. And we can look at what we're looking for as far as hazards. And this one is always my interesting one because Mountain Dew, I don't know, comes in white, but how do you look at hazard communication or in Minnesota, Minnesota right, right to, know. to know. And is there a difference? Well, uh, employee right to know standard was the standard used in Minnesota for many years. And that's transitioned over to the federal or the updated federal hazard communication standard. They really tie together quite, uh, quite well. As far as, you know, um, unlabeled bottles, secondary use type of uh, 
of, of containers, I sure want to see uh, what's in the container and have enough labeling on there to be able to identify it. And you know, food containers should not be used uh, in in the uh, uh, work in the production setting. Okay, so you're looking at this as as a potential citation, and I say potential because you, the investor data, doesn't write the citation. Is that correct? Well, that's no, almost. Um, the investigator writes the citation, but the citation is, and this is legalese. The citation is ultimately issued by the commissioner of the Department of Labor and Industry. Okay, thank you. So, walking through, we identified hazard communication. We identified some labeling. But when you look at it, what has to be done when it looks at uh, container usage and secondary containers? What do you look at and say, hey, that's great, or that needs improvement, or sorry, you're way off base and I'm gonna, I'm gonna write the citation and propose it. Sure, if the employer is following the requirements for labeling that are currently in place uh, for, uh, for secondary containers and other containers, then uh, the investigator is gonna look at that and say, this is good. Uh, if, a, if a container is not completely labeled, but that information is readily available in that area, uh, the investigator may look at that and say, all right, there's enough information for an employee to refer to an area where they can get the full, full picture. Okay. So it kind of comes back to your favorite term, which is... It depends. It depends. Okay. <laughs> Thank right. you. We had to get that out there at some Thank point you, in time. Tim. Thank okay. you. <laughs> so as we move on with our presentation, we're going through this walkthrough, and that's something that I have a lot of questions over the years is, what are they actually doing during the walkthrough? And all of a sudden, they come up to this picture here, and on the wall, we have all of our safety data sheets. Can they be in a chemical form, or excuse me, in a computer format, or do they need to be in this written format that you see here on the screen? Well, again, going back to how the world is changing and everything is going on computer, uh, yes, uh, information of safety data sheets can be stored electronically as long as the employees have immediate access to the, that information. That kind of goes back to do employees know where and how to find them, right? That's correct. So during an interview, would you happen to ask an employee, how, how do you pull up a data sheet if you need to, or how do you find one? Is that oh, a question? Yeah, definitely. I, I would be asking, do you know what a safety data sheet is? And do you know how to find them? Uh, do you understand what they are? And have you had training on the things that you've been exposed to or could be exposed to? Explain that a little bit more. Have you been trained on what you've been or could be exposed to? So during the training, if I'm working with acetone, I need to talk to them about acetone. Is that how do you would you describe that training? I think specific training is important. If an employee is going to be exposed to a particular class of chemicals, they should receive training on that category of chemicals. Okay. And for in Minnesota and, and elsewhere, uh, employees need to be provided this training prior to being set out on the work floor. Thank you for that. If you have any more specific questions, we can get into that with more detail if you want. So um, that's not a part, part of all. So as we move through this walkthrough again, and we look at different types of hazards, once in a while we see hazards that you look at it and you go, well, that's really not an issue. But in the picture you're showing here, is it a concern that you would have as an investigator? Well, it depends, of course, on what, what the investigator sees. But, uh, you know, extra stuff on the floor that hasn't made it into a waste container or a storage container, it might just give a general indication as to the overall safety level of the company. Okay. So again, it doesn't always have to be specific, but it can give you that overview, right? That's right. Appreciate that. Thanks. So again, we're going through, we're looking at our hazards, we're doing through our walkthrough, and now all of a sudden we get to something that is really a strong point of yours for the years, and that's lockout takeout. Sure. Um, what well, do we need to be in compliance for for lockout? Well, uh, the lockout tagout standard has been around since 1991. And it requires that uh, 
the employer develops specific procedures for equipment, uh, that they provide training, and that they provide an annual inspection of the procedures to ensure that those procedures are, are working the way they're supposed to and that employees understand uh, what they need to do. How would you describe for people that aren't real knowledgeable in lockout this authorized, affected, and then other? Sure, authorized employees are those individuals who will be utilizing a lockout procedure and they need to be trained on all aspects of lockout. They need to understand the uh, magnitude and sources of energy and how to isolate and how to test for uh, putting equipment into a safe state. Affected employees are those employees who would be affected by a piece of equipment being locked out. So that might be the machine operator who was working on a machine and now the maintenance worker is going to uh, lock it out to do some work. Other employees is pretty much everyone else, such as office workers, and they, they need to understand this is what lockout is and don't touch anything that's locked out. Okay, so as we go through the lockout procedure a little bit more, I have a couple of pictures and I kind of want your input as this. So as we go back to our procedural format and we look at what's going on in the lockout, does a procedure like this here suffice? Does it meet? Is it more than you need? What's your viewpoint if you were in a company and they said, here's our lockout procedure for this machine? Well, it, <clears throat> you know, a quick glance looks like it has the required elements, uh, purpose, scope, authorization, the rules and techniques, and the means of compliance. So having pictures in there, that's helpful. OSHA does not require pictures, but it's helpful. Okay, so you mentioned purpose and scope. Cover it because I've looked at a lot of procedures and all it says is how to do it. It has nothing to do with purpose and scope. Where does that fit into? OSHA requires that the procedures, each procedure, have a statement of purpose. What is the purpose of this document? Scope, what is the level of work that could be done utilizing this procedure? Authorization, who's authorized to use this procedure? whether it's everybody or only certain individuals. And uh, the rules and techniques are how do we shut the machine down? How do we lock it out? How do we make sure that it's, um, it is locked out? Uh, verification is one of those steps to make sure that it is locked out. And uh, means of compliance, there needs to be a statement that says, if basically, if you don't do lockout tag out, uh, you could be terminated or something like that, okay. whatever the company decides. So the, you mentioned also periodic inspections or what your term was on that? Annual inspections is a requirement uh, to ensure that lockout is being performed, it's being performed adequately, that the procedure is adequate for what's being done, and also to uh, identify if any changes have happened in the last year uh, to the equipment that would necessitate the need for updating the procedure. Fabulous, appreciate that. There is a lot of questions in lockout as we continue to go through our PowerPoint presentation. I wanna make sure that some of those things where I've always told if a lockout tagout accident occurs, it usually requires more than a band-aid. It usually can be very, pretty serious. And that's why you've always put a lot of emphasis on that. In, in my time at OSHA, uh, a large number of the serious injuries and many of the fatalities had a component of lockout tagout as one of the causes that contributed to an, a death or an injury occurring. So it's a big deal. Okay, so we're finishing our walkthrough and, and I gave you just a brief idea of what they look for, but they could be looking at forklift, they could be looking at hoist and chains, a lot of different things within that industry. And if you're on a construction site, they're going to walk through that construction site the same way, looking at the entire process, whether it's one subcontractor or multiple subcontractors. So the flow doesn't change a lot. Is that correct? No, that's correct. That's okay. correct. So now we walk through the facility, you've seen everything that you're, you want to see, you're comfortable with it. We go to this thing called the closing conference um, and we talk about hazards found, abatement dates, things like that. So can you kind of give us an idea? First of all, who should be part of the closing conference? 
And what are you doing in that closing conference? So a management individual does, uh, you, you do want a management individual as part of the closing conference. And this is where the investigator is going to say, these are the things that I saw that may result in citations. And so at this point in time, we're going to discuss uh, what that hazard is, uh, some guidance perhaps on means of abatement, uh, setting a time frame to get it all taken care of. And the employer does, uh, does get informed that the clock starts ticking when the employer receives the paperwork. And that comes in, uh, uh, in, in, in uh, certified mail. And we're being asked, are closing conferences required? Um, closing conferences are generally performed, but they are a courtesy to the employer. Okay, so they, can, can an employer say, I just soon not have a closing conference. I don't really have time for this. Can they avoid it? They, they can. It's not in their best interest, but they, <laughs> they can. Okay. So as we go through this closing conference and we pull up our next slide that talks about some of the other situations and stuff, it says the investigator will discuss rights and responsibilities. It will also talk about possible penalties and such. Can it kind of go through what you're working your way through in this process? Sure. So... Um... The employer has the right to contest any of the citations if they feel that a violation did not occur uh, or the penalty is too much or the abatement date is too short, they can file a notice of contest, which will set up a meeting with uh, the employer and OSHA so, they, so those issues can be discussed. Uh, at the end of the day, the employer has the responsibility to provide a safe and helpful workplace. And again, OSHA provides the minimum standards for that. Okay. Penalties uh, are assessed uh, to, to uh, go along with citations, but at the time of the uh, inspection, the, uh, the, the, the investigator is not going to be uh, able to discuss how much it is because those factors need to be figured out. Okay, so we'll continue on with our presentation here and we'll get you more involved in some of those final comments in a few minutes. So when we look at the penalty and the hazards based on what you see, is this a factual chart that, that's, that's used by OSHA? It is. Um, we'll just stay on the presentation, Maxwell, for a few minutes. So OSHA uses a scale for seriousness that runs A through F as you can see, F being the most serious. And then looking at employee exposure, proximity to the hazard, duration, et cetera, et cetera. And that's going to determine how much the penalty starts out as. You say starts out as, meaning? Well, the employer can get credits for a couple of areas. Uh, size credit, size of the company. There is a graduated scale uh, to, to let employers pay less if they have fewer okay. employees. Great. And uh, then there's a good faith component. So if an employer has safety and health programs in place and they're documented and they're being utilized, a good faith credit can be applied. And the last area for a credit to reduce penalties is history. If an employer has not had adverse uh, dealings with OSHA in the past few years, then that history credit will be applied. Okay, I pulled up our uh, an actual inspection from way back, and I brought it up because a lot of people say, geez, who sees these citations and such? Is this public information? It is. Uh, it's on the internet, on the OSHA, federal OSHA website, and after uh, an OSHA case has been closed, uh, then this information is available. So as we go to the next one, it actually here shows, it says violation summary. Real briefly, because of our time frame, can you hit, hit some of the high points that you, that somebody could look at on this and see, wow, what about this? Well, so there were two, uh, two violations and the total amount was nearly $13,000. But the, uh, 
the, the company and OSHA had a meeting. They sat down, they worked out a few differences and OSHA said, all right, we'll cut you a break and bring the penalty down to $9,000, but you have to fix all these things. So how long does this stay on the website for public information? It stays on the website. It stays on the <laughs> website, okay. Thank you for that. So now we kind of went through the closing conference and everything. And what, what I really want people to understand is having OSHA show up on your website isn't the end of the world if you're prepared. That's correct. Uh, I've actually had employers saying, I'm glad you're here. Not too many of them, but I've had, <laughs> I've had people say, we want to find out if there's a problem. We think we're doing a great job, but you know, you'll help us. Here's the last question before we go to a, another poll in a second is, people always say, well, geez, no matter what we do, folks is going to find something wrong. That's their goal. That's their job is to find something wrong inside us. The goal is to identify hazards that employees are exposed to. And if that happens, the potential for a citation exists. I've been to a, a lot of work sites and done a lot of inspections where the employer has had all their ducks in a row and they have not had a citation. Excellent, thank you for that. So survey two or poll two, does your team know where your documentation is located and able to provide on a moment's notice with OSHA, with an OSHA visit? Yes. Do people know? B, I think so. Or C, I have no idea. Because then that's that opening viewpoint of where that company falls into play, correct? Well, that's right. The more organized a company is, the easier it is for an employer to put their hands on the information that OSHA wants to see, the better it is. And again, if that key person's not there is there's somebody in the backup that, that, that knows that information too right it's <laughs> it's always great to have more than one person have an idea as to what there is and where it is so if it is computer-based they need to have access and knowledge of how to access it on the computer too right that's correct excellent appreciate that so as we finish up the poll on this and we kind of see where we are it looks pretty promising that most of the, most of us there have a pretty good idea of where documents and how to retrieve them. There's some that they think they are, but we better check, and then obviously a few that need a little bit of help, and that's what our ultimate goal here is. So, so as we continue on to make sure we get things done in our time frame basis, I want to encourage, and again, we've missed a few chats, and I apologize for that, but I, we will respond to those um, to make sure you get your questions answered. Uh, at, uh, at the finish of this uh, webinar on that part, because again, that was our ultimate goal is to get that done for you. So as we uh, continue on with our presentation and we look at where we go next, you've now completed that closing conference, okay? Okay. You've walked through, you've gone through the processes. Any key elements before we jump into the last portion that you can tell everybody, I said, hey, we can do a couple things this is really something that's important for you, the investigator. I, I wanna reiterate that it's important to be organized and know where these items are, the safety programs and training records. Training records especially, that's what OSHA wants to see. Uh, if, if the person dealing with OSHA cannot put their fingers on a particular document immediately. It's not the end of the world. Uh, OSHA will work with you and give you some consideration that some time to figure things out. Great, okay. So let's move on and get to this preparation part in our presentation. So thank you again for responding to this poll. It, uh, it really makes it and puts it all into the right uh, perspective of where we are with that. Team preparation, make sure as we just talked about that we let that investigator lead, but we also are part of that process. Make sure that the people on your team know how to answer the right questions and you have the right tools for pictures or measurements. And that if you need outside assistance, which is a third party consultant that OECS is or others out there in the industry, that you get them involved in. So um, wanna look at that question real quick there on COVID, Minnesota presumption rule affected employees. Does someone yeah, want to get I, back to? I, well, I'll perhaps get back to. We'll stay in the think, presentation, uh, Maxwell. I, I think issues relating to COVID are a moving target. And, okay. um, and, and uh, it's probably a little bit more difficult to respond completely to that right now. Okay. 
be organized. Truly, organization is crucial. It shows that safety is really part of your organization, the more organized you are, correct? Well, absolutely. You know, the, the deal is uh, the investigator wants to do his job and uh, the company wants to get the investigator out of the uh, facility as quickly as possible. <laughs> so the more organized you are, the easier and more, you know, better flow and it'll go faster. Okay, so we move to our next potential issue within the Trumpland to presentations. It's, it should be. Okay, so We're waiting for a slide. Yeah, waiting for a slide to move forward. Sorry about that, folks. But what if I came up to you, the investigator, and I, and I have a busy day and said, hey, is this going to take very long? You know, it's it's okay to ask, but there are better there are ways to ask that are that's not offensive to an investigator. And um, depending upon how an employer comes across to an investigator, can can make an an inspection go longer or shorter. Okay, but if I have a two o'clock meeting, I can say, hey, should I reschedule my two o'clock, or do you think we'll be done by then? Well, the investigators probably going to say, you know, I'm not sure if you have someplace you have to be, do you have somebody as a backup that could join in the inspection Excellent. in case we have so you, you can know, rotate further, that further part. to go. Sure. 300 logs. You look at the 300 log. What are you really looking for in a 300 log? Trying to get an idea as to what types of injuries have occurred in the facility, because that can help. Um, having the investigator focus on where the inspection is going to go. Okay. Uh, we looked in here at training records, inspection records, all those factors. So those right. are part of the things you would be looking as you walk through or in the opening or at the end or where would that kind of come into play? Typically, at least for when I was doing inspections, uh, training records and safety programs were uh, uh, were done, uh, were looked at during the opening conference. Okay. So just as an example of, you know, the 300 log that you would look at and mm -hmm. you look at trends, things such as that. Um, when you look at that, you're, again, you're looking at more trends and types of areas. Yeah, that's right. If there's a specific area of a facility that is uh, uh, getting people injured, that's going to be a focus. Okay. So the summary log, which right now isn't advancing for me, I apologize for that. When you look at the end of the year summary log, um, is that something that if it's not filled out correctly or not filled at all, are, are these documents here citable by OSHA? They are citable. It's not real common, but uh, they, they are citable. Excellent. And there's your copy of the summary log right there that you're looking for overall numbers, right? Right. How about this incident report? So the OSHA's form 301 uh, in Minnesota is consistent with the Minnesota first report of injury. Okay, so you can use either one. Yes, yes. Okay. Excellent, perfect on that part. So as we come to the end, we had a few minutes left here. I wanna make sure we cover a couple of key elements that we've reviewed. And, and that's part of that is, is having that plan in place. Um, putting together a system in place that works so that the right people are notified, which makes your job easier, right? Right. That we have the inspection process, we have the documentation accessible, and it all flows really, really smoothly. Because as you said, you've been through inspections over the years that have been great, and you've walked out with no citations. That's correct. So, and the ones that are, I'm assuming, are probably the ones that are most organized and making safety part of their culture. Absolutely. Absolutely. Having a, having a good safety program, an overall program where uh, responsibilities are defined and uh, safety committees are in place, that's always helpful. Okay. Survey three. If OSHA walked into your business right now to conduct an audit after going through what Larry and I have talked about, hey, would you change your viewpoint now? A, we're going to ace it. Would be okay. Not good. Wow. Either we didn't cover some of the heavy hitting stuff or they're really more prepared than they thought, which is great.
Well, it does look like most folks are hopeful that they would be okay and seem to think that they are ready. Yep. And again, as we finish up and wind up our, our, our uh, webinar here, uh, I know there's some chats we didn't get to, and I apologize. We'll get those back to you on that information. But you also have our phone number and email. Please feel free to, to ask any questions that we didn't get to and, um, and move forward so that you have that information so that when OSHA does show up, and again, it's a luck of the draw, I always say, um, you're as prepared as you possibly can. But if you take that safety culture to the highest level, OSHA is the least of your worries, right? That's correct. Right. That's correct. Excellent. Will the PowerPoint be available for us? Yes, I believe it will be uh, on our website. And um, it, it'll be, it's being recorded. It'll be put on our website. You'll have access to it at a later time. It usually takes two or three days to get that done. If I remember right, that's not part of my uh, technology part. So we leave that to the higher powers. So um, OECS, just a little bit about us. We work with companies virtually. We work with companies on site. We utilize a safety system to help things put together. We do LMS systems, as you see here. So if you do have any questions and needing some outside assistance, please reach out to us. Uh, conversations are just that. Um, nothing happens until we need some assistance. How many OSHA inspectors are in Minnesota? I don't know the number right now. Generally, it ran about uh, three dozen or so scattered across the state. But uh, I know there's been uh, new people being hired and older people leaving. So I can't really say how many up there are right now. Okay. And here's the final kind of a summary of our safety solution where we can get into some specific trainings. We can help with, as Larry mentioned earlier, COVID plans to make sure you do have a plan in place, even though it's not a mandate under masks and stuff, there's OSHA still wants you to have a COVID plan because of a infectious disease issue. So ask if there's questions, challenge us. We're here to help you in any way, shape or form. We do put on these webinars monthly and I wanna bring up the fact that our next one is an in, um, industrial hygiene and environmental as soon as that slide pops up. So we encourage you to, to join and um, ask questions as you have. Give us a final rating because we can only get better if you let us know what we're deficient in and uh, how helpful this seminar really was. I appreciate that input. Again, as I told Larry Numis, we lose our feelings and this is really the thing that we want to improve on to uh, make it better for you. So uh, uh, good feedback, bad feedback is all things that we can work towards improvement. Our um, next seminar, our webinar, excuse me, as soon as my clicker moves forward, I apologize for that. Um, is not working at the moment, but again, our uh, webinar is coming up next month. And again, we'll send out notices as we have here that you can sign up for and um, move forward to learn more. And again, that one will be on um, um, industrial hygiene and uh, um, such. So if you didn't have questions, ask, call, or email. I appreciate all input from everybody. And uh, thank you for your time. And as we get to hopefully the last slide, my advance button is not for some reason playing fair with me. Yep, and the next webinar is going to be November 18th. All right, if anyone has any questions. So thank you very much. If, um, Go ahead, Heather. I was just saying, if anyone has any more questions, feel free to put those in the chat box. We'll hang around for a few minutes to get those answered. Our next webinar is based on environmental and industrial hygiene. The date is November 18th, 11 to uh, 12 p.m. And uh, again, I thank everybody for your input. Uh, again, we'll respond to those chat questions and get back to you at that time. So thanks and have a great day and a great weekend coming up. Appreciate it.